Let's talk about the Retirement Benefits Authority. And we're now joined by the CEO of the Retirement Benefits Authority, Nzomo Mutuku, MBS, Moran of the Burning Spear. Heshima, Bonamuga, Heshima. No, ma, don't just Heshima, Maximum Heshima. Heshima, yes. uh, Maximum. I mean, they, 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 they don't just sell those things in the marketplace mm -mm. where you can say, Nataka MBS tattoo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, 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 you're celebrating 20 years of growing the sector, of regulating the sector, of making sure that Kenyans' retirement benefits are safeguarded. Um, tell us about the work that you've done so far. Yes, thank you. Um, it's been an exciting uh, journey <coughs> over the last 20 years. Um, RBA was created um, in an act of parliament called the Retirement Benefits Act, which was passed in 1997, but commenced in 2000. So actually 2020 was our... 20th year in October, but we are celebrating the 20th anniversary for one year, um, up to June this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an exciting journey. Um, we have seen a lot of growth in the industry. Uh, when we started, the industry was small. It was less than 100 uh, billion uh, shillings in assets. Today we are at 1.3 trillion in terms of assets. Uh, the industry was only covering around 12% of, um, of the labor force. Today we have grown it up to... Um, 22% of the labor force. So good growth and very impressive compared to most African countries, but of course still a lot of room for, for more bringing more people on, um, on board. Um, as RBA, our mandate is to, as you say, regulate and supervise uh, pension schemes. We have over 1,250 pension schemes that uh, we, we supervise. Uh, we also have a mandate to protect uh, the members of those schemes. Uh, so we do consumer protection. If they have any challenges, you know, with their schemes, they come to us, we assist them. Uh, we also have a mandate to develop, and that's why we have talked about the growth uh, over, the, over the years. And uh, we also have a mandate in terms of policy and implementing government um, uh, policies in, in, in this area. So it has been a good 20 years, but uh, we still have a lot to do uh, to make sure all Kenyans are really covered um, for, for their return. Anytime I uh, come across the RBA, my mind automatically moves to NSSF. Uh, before you came into the studio, Eric had made this quip, because if you look at my beard, then I am the sort of person who would want to talk greatly about the NSSF <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the benefits thereof. But what I want to ask you is this. You've explained generally what the RBA does. But now tell me, how exactly does the RBA's functions benefit the majority of Kenyans who have been employed and whose scheme is with the NSSF? Yes, NSSF is one of the schemes that we regulate, one of the 1,250 that um, I mentioned. Um, NSSF, of, of, NSSF, of course, has had a um, uh, difficult history. Uh, before we came, um, there were a lot of issues. Even after we came and um, there was a period where they were exempted from complying with our requirements um, so we have not been with them for so long uh, but nevertheless over the time that they have been required to comply with rba requirements we have seen a huge improvement in um, the nsf operations mm. um, if you look at their investments for example when rba came they had something like 70 percent of the assets in in real estate um, which was a very risky portfolio and which also had issues of liquidity and so on. Mm. Um, today, NSF is, you know, compliant with our regulations, which require only a maximum of 30%. So they are 20-something percent. So they have come all the way from 70 uh, to 20% uh, to comply with our regulations. Um, NSF now um, has annual general meetings where members can come and raise um, concern. Uh, NSF issues statements. If you dial uh, star 303 hash on your phone, uh, you can get uh, your, your, your statements and so on. Uh, these are things that have uh, never used to, to happen. Mm. And even in terms of a lot of the governance issues, uh, we have seen a lot of improvement in governance. 
uh, the scandals which used to be there in the past, you don't get them nowadays uh, because, you know, uh, the way our regulatory framework is, um, for example, in investments, um, we require all schemes, including NSSF, to have independent fund managers who are professional investment experts. So the days where the scheme itself would invest and you would have all kinds of issues are long gone. They have appointed fund managers. They have, a, they have a six fund managers. Uh, these are companies which um, are experts in investment. Um, they have also appointed custodians. Mm -hmm. uh, these are banks um, which keep the assets so that the assets are safe. Um, so not just for NSF, for all the schemes that we regulate, you know, we have a very uh, strong uh, regulatory uh, framework which has all these checks and balances. So, for example, the investment decisions are done by a fund manager who is a professional, licensed by us, also licensed by CMA, Capital Market Authority. Mm -hmm. The assets are kept by a custodian who is a different person who is a bank, licensed by Central Bank uh, to do custody business um, so that you know nobody can reach um, 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 the assets. And then the scheme must invest in accordance with guidelines uh, which we have issued, including uh, the 30% maximum I gave on, on real estate investments and other requirements to ensure diversification. Mm -hmm. So yes, we all know NSF had uh, checkered past, but I also want to assure members now that um, because of the requirement to comply with RBA uh, regulations, uh, they are now um, uh, a very different institution. Mm -hmm. Dovetailing from that question, <coughs> because what I would really like to know, because I'm sure there are very many of our listeners who have reached that mandatory age of retirement and they would like to know, with all the streamlining that has taken place and with all the, should we say, the lay down procedures that people have for accessing their dues, is it something that someone who has reached that mandatory age, are they assured that they can actually go to NSSF or reach them through whatever portal that exists and that they will be served as is stipulated? Yes, because the law um, requires uh, pension schemes to pay uh, people who retire within 30 days. Mm -hmm. All schemes, including NSSF. So if for any reason you have not been paid within the required period, that is why you come to us because mm -hmm. we are there to protect, like I said, we have the consumer protection mandate. Mm -hmm. So you can file a complaint with us and you don't even have to come physically to us because we have a complaints portal which is uh, you know, on our website. Uh, we have an app. You can download the app and you can file your complaint through the app or you can reach us on our toll-free numbers and so on. So you can use these channels um, or you can, of course you can also come to office if you, if, if you want and we can assist you there. Um, you can use these channels to file a complaint and we take it up on your behalf and uh, we'll make sure that um, you're paid your due, your due benefits. So this is for all the schemes mm -hmm. including NSSF. So a couple of years ago, there was a robust movement uh, by the RBA to really get Kenyans to think about the future mm -hmm. and to say, you know, um, the opportunities for you to make sure that you're nestled uh, in comfort. Um, why was that after some time? You know, moving away from the regulatory position and to really encourage Kenyans to, to make sure that the future is not a rainy one. Why was that push um, specifically at that time? Uh, yes, um Traditionally, um, pension schemes have been kind of for people in the formal sector. Mm. You find a company like, you know, here, yes, Standard Media Group, they have a pension scheme for their, for their staff. And, you know, most companies, they do that. Uh, but there was this large group that we were leaving out, and this is the group in the informal um, sector, yeah. mm. which is also where we have a lot of uh, the youth. Um, so we made a conscious effort, and it is in our new strategic plan that we are currently implementing, that we need to give more focus to the informal sector. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because I really want to reach out to, um, so I know for you guys, is, is, you're not my target group. <laughs> 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 my, my target group is the younger people, because you want them to start saving now, so that by the time they reach your age, mm. they are very, uh, they, they, they're very comfortable. So we have been making an effort here, you're absolutely right, we have been making an effort to reach out to, um, uh, to, the, to the informal sector, to reach out to the youth. Mm. And, um, you know, there are three aspects to that. Um, one is this, you know, talking about it, sensitizing people about why and how they can save for, for retirement. Um, two was making sure that, you know, the regulatory framework and the laws also accommodate uh, the informal sector, which we have done. Mm. Uh, and the third one um, is what I mentioned earlier, which is um, uh, leveraging on, on, on technology, particularly mm. mobile phone technology, so that when you're in the informal sector, 
you know, you don't have a payroll. Uh, you may not even have a bank account, which is what we traditionally use in pension schemes. Uh, but you're able to join a scheme just from your phone by dialing, you know, a number like the one I gave. Mm. Uh, you're able to register for a scheme. You're able to make contributions. You're able to get, uh, you know, statements through the same phone. You're even able to attend AGMs and so on, uh, all through uh, the phone, uh, which makes it very easy for uh, for somebody um, um, to, uh, to join. So I think technology has helped us a lot uh, mm -hmm. because before, you know, the structures were very rigid, uh, but now we are able to reach out to anybody uh, to save for, for, for retirement. What's the uptake? I mean, if you're looking across the country, informal sector, like you said, you know, largest part of the workforce in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the uptake now in terms of people planning for the future? Are people getting more excited about it, um, taking up what is on offer? Yes, we had very good response. Um, when we started this back in 2019, um, the coverage rate was below 20%. Now we have gone up to 22%. So we had very good response. And what we would do is we would go out to the grassroots. Mm. You know, traditionally, maybe you see RBA in, uh, you know, in the more formal settings, the yeah. newspapers and the TV and so on. But now we go to the grassroots. We go to vernacular stations. We go to markets. And uh, we talk to people directly. And uh, when we go there, we go together with them. Um, you know, the service provider, because we ourselves, of course, are the regulators, so mm. people are not joining us. So yeah. we have to go with the schemes themselves so that yeah. people can join them, um, uh, can join them, um, the schemes. So we had very good um, uptake. But unfortunately, when uh, the COVID uh, pandemic came, uh, first of all, we had to stop those activities. So mm. we have not been going to the field since then. Um, and second, of, of course, um, with the economic disruption, it became very difficult to you know, to push the message of of joining um, a scheme. Sure. Uh, but ironically, uh, you know, um, one of the th things, you know, there's always a silver lining. Mm. Uh, one of the things which came from the COVID um, is that, you know, those who had previously joined pension schemes, and let's say COVID came and they lost their jobs, you know, because of the retrenchments and so on. Yeah. They were able to go to those schemes and get something out, which was able to push on them. Mm. So one of the lessons that we are saying is, you know, look, yes, we are saving for retirement, but this pension scheme, because our law does allow you to access some of your money when you lose your job, uh, it can also cushion you in case of these kind of shocks mm. uh, like COVID, which nobody expected and which came uh, very fast. Um, so you look at the long term, but you also know that this is, a, you know, something that can also come in very handy in case of, um, in case of sudden uh, shocks like a retrenchment and so on. I think that's a lot of good education that you will say you were doing, going around the country, uh, speaking to various stakeholders, and especially going with the schemes. Do the schemes then follow up with more education? Because there could be that gap of awareness, and clearly that gap exists on awareness from this is this even differentiating. This is pension scheme. This is life insurance. This is insurance. And people just getting mixed up in all of them and thinking, Pension is just an SSF or pension is when you're employed and that money is deducted. But how do I contribute to pension and how can I benefit from pension? Are you seeing like there's a need for creation of more awareness on this, more education? There's need for a lot more, um, a lot more awareness and a lot more education. And you know, RBA cannot do it alone. Uh, we need um, other players like the media, mm. and, you know, the government and uh, the, the providers um, to also do their role in terms of education. One of the things that we did together with other financial regulators, uh, the central bank, uh, the CMA, the IRA, was to develop um, issues to do with uh, financial services <coughs> in the curriculum. In the new CBC uh, curriculum, which is uh, starting now, mm -hmm. um, you know, we worked with um, the, the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development and we assisted them to put in place some of these measures. So that from the time one is in school, from very early in school, you start hearing some of these words in very simple terms. Yeah. You, know, you start hearing what is saving, you know, what is pension, what is... Yeah. Uh, and it's done, you know, through... It's not done in a direct way. It's done in a very indirect manner, uh, which, you know, the, the young people can, can understand. So that as they, you know, get older and they go into more, uh, start working and so on, these are not alien concepts and they're able to differentiate between the different um, products. So this is something that is coming. Of course, it will take time because the curriculum is just uh, starting now. Mm. Uh, but as the curriculum, as the people move up uh, 
it will really help mm. in terms of that sort of basic financial um, literacy. Have you done or have you considered including this? Ex I'm, I'm excited about it because it's something we've talked about at great length with regards to how you inculcate a certain idea into people's mind and at what stage. Have you thought or have you done anything to ensure that even at the level of our colleges, our universities, post-secondary school institutions, have you thought of including this in? That is the end game. Uh, we are starting from down. Mm -hmm. uh, CBC moves from uh, this grade four to grade five. You know, mm -hmm. Eventually, when it will reach the university level, uh, it will it will be there. So mm -hmm. we are starting from the from 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 the bottom. May I venture to say that <coughs> perhaps you may be missing out on something important here, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. You see, whatever curriculum is used in teaching people at these post uh, secondary school institutions, they are a lot easier. To change, they are a lot easier to to have new ideas being introduced. Yes, just like they can introduce new courses, a subject like which involves what it is that you offer. I believe that perhaps you and your team should consider uh, how best you can actually reach because those are people who are closer to the job market than those in primary school. And it is not as though they would not understand the benefits that you speak of. They would. And if it starts early, uh, certainly there would be great benefit, uh, beneficiaries from it. Uh, my, my thinking. You're right, of course. Um, you know, in the university, we have people who are doing things which um, are really related to us. Right? Yes. Not actual science, so yes. Bachelor of Commerce. Yes. So those guys, of course, they know, uh, they know. what you're doing. But if you are doing, um, you know, engineering, you might not know anything about... Let's start uh, with Bachelor of Arts. Or Bachelor of Arts. <laughs> Uh, no, but if I did Bachelor of Arts Economics. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I don't want to talk badly about Bachelor of Arts. Yes, yes. Well, don't worry. <laughs> but, I, I, I also said something similar, so I, I will speak about myself really. Yes. Uh, but you're right. You know, as a lot of those programs you may not really interact much with, you know, financial sector issues and mm. uh, and yes. so on. So I mean, yeah, we can. I think it's a good idea. We can see how we can work um, um, in the universities, especially, you know, the first year where you where. The, they used to do some more general things. I know they used to do communication and so yes. on. That could be the time to bring on, on board um, some of these issues. Because uh, uh, you just think of that population of people who are working towards entering the job market yep. at whatever level. And whatever level they find themselves in, even after that education, if this idea is inculcated as part of it, more so they, it will become even more pertinent as they stay and as they grow in the job market. And the, 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 the sooner that idea is introduced, well, should be the larger the population that we will, we will reach and the possibility of it will be enhanced. Yeah, no, you're right. And, um, you know, one thing that people don't know in particular about pensions is that when you save for in a pension scheme, it is actually a tax advantaged way of saving. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can save in your bank account, you can save in your circle, you can save in so many uh, pyramid schemes and so on. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> you know, the pension, first of all, it is highly regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked about the separation where you have managers and custodians and all these uh, trustees and investment policies and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, uh, it's also tax advantage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you put money into your pension scheme, it, it is tax deductible. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we are two of us, you, we are both earning, let's say, 50,000. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you put your 10,000 in your bank account mm -hmm. and I put my 10,000 in my pension okay. scheme. Uh, when I'm paying care, I will pay tax on 40,000. The 10,000 would be deducted from the right. But for you, you will pay tax on the 50,000. <laughs> 50. So, so the 10,000 <laughs> that you will have been saving will already have been, will have been taxed. Mm. So, I mean, there's a lot of information that uh, we, need, we, we need to get out there so that people can appreciate, um, mm. uh, you know, the value of saving for pension. And I think then you also need to um, push this, this registered schemes. 1,250 schemes, those are many. And they'll be able to reach out to very many people in the population using various platforms going accompanying you on the road shows using social media using digital other digital platforms using mainstream media like ourselves to just create that awareness which is just not just saying that you all come and register but what is a pension scheme what are the benefits of pension scheme like you're saying if it's tax deductible if it's already giving you some tax advantage that is one of the benefits 
uh, how much can you start contributing and how can you benefit from this? We're having a conversation with the Chief Executive Officer of the Retirement Benefits Authority, Nzomo Motuko. He is here to talk about the Retirement Benefits Authority and what it's done to safeguard Kenyans' retirement benefits. Nzomo, you're telling us about you know, the benefits of saving either registered, and I must add here, registered retirement benefit schemes. Maybe you'll tell us about the unregistered schemes, but also what's the advantage of saving with a registered retirement benefit scheme as opposed to others? Uh, savings methods, for example, circles, for example, banks, uh, mattress, investing in CT's business, <laughs> and such. Uh, thank you. Um, um, firstly, um, when you save the registered scheme, and um, in, in terms of registration, um, just to be clear, you know, all the, the pension schemes are registered with us. Uh, but there's normally another talk of registration, which is for tax. You can also register for the tax um, uh, benefit. And that's why sometimes you hear registered and unregistered. Uh, but for you to get the tax benefit, you must be registered with RBA first. Um, and basically everybody goes for it because it's, it's basically um, a benefit to your members. So the tax, um, like I mentioned, um, there's, there's tax benefit when you save for, for, for retirement. Uh, you get the tax deductibility on your contribution up to 20000 uh, that uh, that you enjoy. Pension schemes, when they invest, the uh, the income is tax-free. Other investors, you know, they pay withholding tax and so on on interest. Even when you have money in your bank, you get interest. You have to pay some tax. Pension schemes don't um, uh, don't don't pay that tax. And then when you retire, um, up to twenty-five thousand per month is tax-free. Uh, lump sums up to six hundred thousand per month. Six hundred thousand is tax-free. And the best part, once you reach age sixty-five, then is all tax free if it's coming from a pension scheme. So there's the tax um, advantage, which is a big advantage over any other form of saving. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, the tax, the pension is a highly regulated product. Um, we have RBA up there, um, which sets the rules on which uh, regulates and supervises all the schemes, and we use what is called risk-based supervision. So for all the 1,250 schemes. We calculate their risk based on 31 parameters. These parameters are financial, they are governance. Uh, you know, if a scheme has a lot of complaints, it will have high risk. If a scheme has low investment income, it will have high risk. If mm -hmm. a scheme has high cost, it will have high risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a scheme delays in paying pension, as you mentioned, it would have high risk. And we would put a lot of attention on high risk uh, schemes. And then the low risk, we will not worry so much because they are running um, well. So they're highly uh, regulated. And then we have all these checks and balances where they have to use a fund manager, custodian, and there's a board of trustees which oversees um, uh, the scheme. Okay. Uh, <coughs> number three, as pension schemes now have a lot of very exciting um, uh, products uh, which you don't get in other, other forms of savings. Um, a few years ago, we introduced something called post-retirement medical fund. Mm. Uh, this is on top of saving for your retirement, you can also save for your medical through the same scheme, but medical in retirement. Mm. Because what we found is many older people, uh, medical cost is their biggest Problem. cost. Yep. Mm -hmm. To make matters worse, um, you know, they have all these medical issues, but when they would go for insurance, they would have a struggle to get it. Some mm. insurance refused to cover older people, yep. Yep. or it was too expensive. Mm. Um, so what we did is we came up with this product where the scheme, you know, you, you save through the scheme while you're still young, you build up um, um, a separate fund for medical. When you retire, the scheme purchases for you uh, the medical. Now the scheme is in a much stronger negotiating position than any you know out there trying yeah. to get uh, to get. Mm. So it's able to negotiate a low premium. It's able to take up you know a large number of customers. So the medical provider is very happy to, to take that business, yeah. um, and therefore they negotiate a good package and this is for the rest of, of your life after you after you retire okay. and this is built within the scheme this is okay. brilliant how much do i contribute to that uh, the way it works is um you target what kind of cover you want in um in retirement okay and also it also depends on how old you are the younger then you contribute very little because you have plenty of time to contribute mm. if you're older then you have to contribute more because you have less time so uh, the scheme will give you options and say, you know, when you when you retire, what kind of cover do you want? Do you want to be going to Aga Khan? You know, do you want to be just going to the mission hospital and so on? And then they will be able to calculate and tell you, okay, if that is what you're targeting, then this is how much you need to contribute now, given your age and, you know, the, all those factors. Okay. 
Um, so it, it differs from member uh, member to member depending on their, their circumstance. Looking at all these things, you're taking into consideration and then saying you want to grow it. Because uh, you have talked about 22%, 24%. Mm. You want to grow it in the next in the coming years to 30% of Kenya's population that at least is protected for retirement. How will you do this? Um, we have to sell it to the people. Uh, uh, saving culture in Kenya is not very good. Mm. Uh, saving for anything is generally very low. And that's why our gross uh, saving rate is, is, is pretty low. It's less than 10% now. Uh, when you compare with you know those emerging tigers, for example, which are able to generate 25%, 30% uh, gross saving uh, rate. Mm. So saving uh, rate is very low. So we need to go out there and first of all, let people know why it's good to save for retirement. And you know, we, 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 we show them the benefits. Two, um, we need to build confidence mm. because again, Kenyans have burnt their fingers in pyramid schemes and yeah. you know, so on. So people are sometimes are reluctant uh, any, to do anything. So we need to build um, uh, confidence. Three, we need to make it easy for people to save because you know nobody wants a long process. Nobody wants to go fill forms, mm. and definitely nobody wants that when they retire, they have to go and run around <laughs> looking for their money. Or you even beg for it. You no, know, nobody wants that kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have to, you know, build that um, uh, uh, that confidence, and then we have to add these value additions that we are talking about. Like now, the post-retirement medical is one. Another one that we have just brought just last year is on housing. Um, if you have accumulated some good money in your in your pension scheme, you can actually take some of it out to buy a house mm. uh, before retirement age. Uh, because another thing that we found apart from medical is that some retirees um, were paying rent and so on. And we've even had cases um, you know, of elder guys being evicted from their homes and mm. so on. Yeah. Um, so it's good that when you reach retirement, at least you have your own home. Um, so that at least you don't worry about rent. Mm -hmm. You can worry about other things, but at least uh, rent is not one of them. So we have put it again within the scheme a structure which can enable you to get a house um, while you're still young, so that when you retire, you get that. Uh, so we need to have these value additions. And um, another area that we are really working hard on is also bundling the pension with some other financial products that, um, I know you talked about the confusion, but sometimes it's good if you have other products that can assist you and let me give you the example of of, of of insurance you know sometimes people have a pension scheme and then they get a shock in life like let's say somebody passes away mm -hmm. and then they want to get the pension money out so that they can you know pay for maybe funerals or medical mm -hmm. and so on yeah so if the pension was bundled with the insurance then you know the pension would not be impacted one would use the insurance part to pay for you know, we have funeral covers, we yeah. have medical covers, we have mm -hmm. life covers and so on. So we are also seeing, can we perhaps bundle some of these products? Again, when we're looking at informal sector, um, they also get shocks in their business. Yeah, somebody is, uh, you know, he's having a small uh, kiosk and then county guys come and demolish it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a shock and he needs some urgent money um, uh, to, 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 to get back onto business. And again, this puts pressure on the pension side because yep. you're saying, I have money in the pension scheme. Can I get it out and, uh, you know, mm. use it to get and back? And use it. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So again, if we can maybe bundle with credit so that one can get a quick loan and, you know, get back on his feet and not, not affect the pension. Mm. Um, so yes, um, we have brought on board those value additions in terms of medical and housing, but we're also looking at other areas that we can perhaps uh, bundle with them, mm. with, uh, with the pension. So can we go back to the, to the informal sector? Uh, because mm -hmm. I think the uh, assumption is that, you know, informal sector is only the, the, the person who is pushing the cart or who is selling vegetables, but that other people, informal sector, who are not working in a nine to five job, mm -hmm. for example. So it's across board, across, you know, cadres of society, across the social strata. What does somebody need to do to say, okay, fine, they've made a decision. I want to uh, save for my f for my future after I retire. What do they need to do? Where do they need to go? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, it's not only um, you know the, maybe uh, the informal sector which is not saving. We also have people who are more or less in the formal sector who are also not saving mm -hmm. yep. uh, because. Uh, the schemes are started by employers. It's not all employers who have uh, schemes. So some people maybe only have the NSSF. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have other schemes. And NSSF is not going to be enough for somebody um, in retirement. 
Um, so what they need to do is um, we have a category of schemes that is called individual pension plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 36 of them that we have registered. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go, for example, to our website, you can get the list of all um, the 36 um, and information about them. Actually, from our website, you can link to their, their own um, uh, websites. So some of these are more of the traditional schemes, um, uh, which, you know, uh, operate through, uh, you send money to them every month, maybe through your bank account and so on. Others are the ones I talked about, which are the mobile-based uh, platforms. Mm. Um, so with those ones, you don't need to physically um, have a bank account and all that. So the IPPs is the product that we have to bring on board all these other groups. And, you know, uh, the other day we were talking to um, entrepreneurs, um, the young, uh, it was called um, the top 35 under 35. Mm -hmm. So these are entrepreneurs who have done well um, at a young age. Uh, but most of them did not have any pension arrangement um, at all. So mm -hmm. we were really pushing them uh, to see how they can join uh, one of these schemes. Sportsmen. A lot of sportsmen, we hear of sportsmen making a lot of money, yeah. but you find they don't have uh, pension uh, arrangements. Last year, we were very uh, happy that um, we brought on board the lawyers. A lot of lawyers have sole proprietorships, uh, just one or two people in the company. Many of them did not have pension schemes. Uh, but we worked with LSK, we worked with the, the, the association, the Welfare Association of Lawyers, mm -hmm. and we have started a pension scheme, uh, which is creating lawyers, so now lawyers are able to, uh, to join um, uh, those kind of schemes. So we have a wide variety of um, individual pension plans, one can find the one which um, uh, which which suits them um, suits them. I'm going to open up the, the phone lines now for anybody who's got a question for the CEO of the Retirement Benefits Authority, who's in the studio with us, Nzomo Mutuko. Zero seven one nine zero one two six hundred. That's the number to call in. That's zero seven one nine zero one two six hundred. Any questions regarding pension, pension schemes, your retirement benefits, and how you can either access any of these registered schemes or how you can put your money in, how you can get your money out if you're having challenges. Also on social media, Spice FM KE, on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Arnold Asawa says, uh, there's a question top there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Please share with the uh, the RBA website so we can get more information about the post-retirement medical fund. Uh, what's the RBA website again? Uh, that's www.rba.go.ke. Okay. So rba.go.ke. Okay. Another question on this medical fund, I think, is something that people are quite interested in, uh, and in terms of them not knowing that it, it was there for them to use. And so the question is so you had mentioned that I can start saving now uh, into the future. Does it guarantee that I will have access to this medical fund for insurance for the rest of my days, or is it on a yearly basis? Um. It will depend on scheme to scheme. Um, some schemes have negotiated to buy, you know, cover for a longer period. Mm -hmm. Some schemes have do it on annual basis. So mm -hmm. they say this year we are getting this cover, the next year we do it and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it, it depends. An evolving product is very new. Uh, not many schemes have it. Um, but it's, it's really picking up. For example, in our, in our institution, RBA, we have it. And uh, not only are the employees contributing, mm. but as, as an employer, I'm also contributing right. okay. for, the mm. for the employees into the post-retirement medical fund. Mm. So even though it was a voluntary thing, I didn't force anybody. All my employees have joined 100% and uh, we are contributing and they are contributing. So Your really employees are the choir. They, they have already <laughs> <been> converted. <laughs> yes, they absolutely. can see the benefit from the get-go. Let's get uh, to the phone lines. 0719012600. Any questions for the RBA CEO? Steve in Nairobi is on the line. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Hi, Latif. Hello. How are you? Oh, uh, it's, I'm good. So I have a question to Zomo. Okay. I used to work for CRBC, the one who, the one that was constructing the Standard Gauge Railway in section in Makindu. Mm -hmm. So a while back, I followed up. Uh, the, I used to be have my NSSF being deducted. So a while back, I followed uh, to the NSSF, and they found that the deductions were not being remitted. Mm -hmm. So NSSF were not able to assist me to follow up these uh, deductions because the company, since the SDR was is completed, it was bundled out. So how can I uh, get this uh, money back to NSSF? How can you get your reprieve? All right. He's going yes, to answer yes. you there, 
uh, Steve, just stay on the line. Eric is also on the line and he has a question. Eric, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Uh, you have a question I, for Nzomo. Yes, I have a question for the CEO. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for, I mean, uh, engaging with us on the mainstream media, especially on this important topic on retirement. Uh, my question is uh, in relation to these uh, lab trust funds. Uh, perhaps maybe the CEO could shed some light on it uh, about how it works and whether whether RBA has some oversight over this love trust uh, fund because of the fact that they were actually existing the defunct during the the, the, the defunct constitution. Okay. And secondly, he had also raised some issue on the tax uh, advantages that you get from pension. Um, investing in pension or pension savings. Maybe you could also elaborate on it. Sawa, sawa. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. Answer those two questions. Thank you. Those are good questions. Um, the first one of um, contributions to NSSF and uh, the, the sponsor or the employer has, um, has relocated or disappeared. Mm. I think a company is a legal entity and um, you know whether or not they have moved out if they have liabilities in Kenya, I think those liabilities can be followed up because the company must be headquartered, whether it's in China or wherever, mm. uh, wherever it is. And um, you cannot just take off from a, com- a country and leave uh, liabilities uh, behind. Probably there are also others apart from, from NSSF. Um, so I think NSSF cannot say that um, because they have left now, um, uh, the money is, uh, is lost or something. No, um, I think uh, it can still be followed up. What I would suggest is um, you file a complaint with us, a formal complaint. I mentioned that um, we have um, uh, the portal or you can write or, or whatever means that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can, we can, we can take it up. And so you can and visit your offices as well and, and, and file can the complaint. Our offices. We are in um, Raimtula um, Tower. Okay. Um, Lab Trust. Uh, Lab Trust is a scheme that we regulate, absolutely. Uh, Lab Trust was created um, way back and it was a scheme which was catering for the local authorities uh, before before devolution um, when we had uh, the local authorities um, and there were two schemes there was a uh, lab trust and there was lab fund and the reason there were two is because back in those days they felt that the senior staff should be in one uh, scheme and the junior staff should be in another scheme uh, but of course um, that uh, that is not allowed anymore in fact our act doesn't allow you to discriminate mm-hmm. you know you, if you have a scheme all your staff should be in the same in the same scheme um, so both of them are, are regulated by us. Um, what happened is when um, the evolution came and moved to counties, um, Lab Trust um, changed the name from Lab Trust to County Pension Fund, mm. uh, just to be in line with the new with the new um, uh, circumstances. Yeah. Uh, but they have a number of schemes. They have one of the individual schemes I talked about, which is open to anybody, uh, and then they have. Um, uh, the traditional lab trust, uh, which is closed, um, they closed that scheme, and then they have uh, the CPF um, uh, scheme. Um, so counties can opt to register their workers in either lab trust or lab fund, um, and they do. Uh, so they are still contributing, and the scheme is still operating and it's regulated by us, and it follows all the rules, um, just like um, uh, just like any other scheme. Uh, so. Um, I think I, I just want to go back to that question that was raised earlier on an employer not remitting uh, deductions to a retirement scheme, even including NSSF. And then what's the reprieve for that employee? Because we hear very many complaints, not just from uh, companies that have, let's say, closed shop, but companies that are still in existence. In fact, at some level, government entities that do not remit some of these deductions. So what is it that an employee can do? To make sure that they their their deductions are actually remitted to the fund. Yes, this is a this is a big problem for us, and um, unfortunately, it has become even worse um, with the with the COVID um, with the COVID pandemic. Um, we have some culprits, and actually, counties are one of the culprits, and it's very unfortunate uh, because we would expect you know the counties to to set a good example. Mm-hmm. So we have counties which have failed to remit to those schemes I was talking about, lab trust and lab fund. And that is the biggest chunk of unremitted um, contributions. Mm. The other set of culprits is the universities. Um, the universities used to have very good schemes, are doing very well. 
when we had the reforms in the education sector and you know the parallel programs which used to be a big revenue stream for them uh, disappeared they started running into financial um, uh, problems mm -hmm. and one of the areas that they started um, failing to comply was remittance of statutory contributions pensions and others so universities um, owe some good money um, 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 to the scheme mm -hmm. um, so what we do um, you know we have various sanctions that we can apply um, one of those sanctions that we have done um, and i don't want to mention which companies uh, is we actually order them to stop the deductions mm -hmm. you see if if you are getting your payslip and your payslip is saying that um, you know 5000 has been deducted and sent to the scheme but it has not actually been sent to the scheme yeah mm. It's better that we stop and then you have, they give you the 5,000 yourself. Then you can bring it to the scheme. As an IPP or take it to the scheme personally. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we have ordered some uh, to stop the deductions. Yeah. Um, others, um, you know, we have agreed remedial plans. And those remedial plans sometimes involve transfer of assets from uh, the company to, um, to the scheme. Yeah. So, for example, uh, some of the buildings in town which were owned by the universities have been transferred to the pension scheme to make up that unremitted uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. uh, we actually go to the courts and say, look, you know, these guys are not um, uh, are not remitting. Uh, they owe so much money to the scheme. We want you to wind up the scheme and appoint a liquidator to go for the assets of the company well, the and have them transferred um, to, 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 to the scheme. So those are the measures that we take. But uh, the other thing that we did, of course, is because... Um, our parent ministry, the National Treasury, we have always been alerting the Treasury. I know Treasury is the one which provides budget to mm. some of these institutions. Mm. <laughs> uh, so they have now made that issue of statutory contributions, um, you know, a key. When you go for budget discussions, the first thing they ask you is, have you remitted all your statutory contributions? Nice. And uh, you, can, you can't come here for money <laughs> when you have not been. Because one thing about the Treasury, they may cut budgets of institutions, mm. but they will never cut budgets for personal emoluments, mm. including the pension. Mm. You know, there's no way they will not give money which is enough to cover for the pension and the salaries. Right. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is not remitting, it means that money which Treasury sent them for salaries has been diverted to something else. Right. Uh, because there's no way Treasury would say we're not giving you money for salaries, <laughs> even if they say there are budget cuts and so on. The salaries must be, it must be paid. Must be paid. Um, so. We are happy now that uh, you know we are getting the backing of the, of the, mm. the government. Of course, we had his Excellency the President himself talk about statutory uh, deductions and pending bills that they must be paid. Yeah. Um, so we are happy that with that pressure, uh, this issue will be resolved. Um, so once and so, so there's some, there's teeth to bite. Yes. All right. Let's hear from John before we look at other questions as well. John in Nairobi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah. First, I'm happy that we are having this discussion yep. because I think for a long time. Uh, the issue of the pension has not been uh, uh, looked into. Mm -hmm. And especially, uh, my question goes to the issue of NSSF. Because I'm assuming that is uh, the biggest pension scheme mm -hmm. that we have. But if you look at the way uh, it is uh, structured, it's sold to the people, and the way the private uh, pension schemes are being run, Somebody is left wondering why should I continue to contribute to NSSF mm. while I can make my contribution uh, to, to, to the private pension schemes. Yeah. Uh, because uh, it appears like I'm, I'm going to benefit more through the private make, uh, pension scheme as compared to NSSF. Mm. While yet, NSSF should be our first uh, uh, choice of pension scheme. Mm because it is the largest it is a government sponsored mm. i believe in other countries the government pension schemes are the most uh, uh viable compared to the private ones mm. so i don't know what uh, uh he thinks about the issue of nssf and what can be done to improve the nssf okay thank you yes uh, so john that's a very good um very good question Normally in the pension system, we have uh, what we call pillars. Um, we have what we call the zero pillar, which is what government does through uh, Inuka Jami program, where they, they give um, some 2,000 or 3,000 every month to elderly persons, mm. uh, just to make sure that at least people are not in really absolute um, uh, poverty. 
And then normally you have a first pillar, which again is a government scheme, which is like NSSF, um, which again provides basic income mm -hmm. and is mandatory. You know, NSF is mandatory for for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's working is supposed to be in NSF. Even those in the informal mm -hmm. sector are supposed mm -hmm. to actually join uh, NSSF. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have now the third and fourth, which is the private system, which is voluntary, which is the one that we are we are we are pushing for people to join uh, schemes on voluntary basis, and you know save, which is what we call an income replacement pillar. So it's no longer now basic social security; it is you are trying to maintain your standard of living when you retire. So you are trying to replace the so that you have similar income to when you are working or something like two thirds of the income that you had when you work. Mm. So NSF is really supposed to provide this basic um, uh, 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 social security and it should be mandatory for everybody. Now, back in 2013, uh, the NSF Act was amended and a new act came um, which brought some uh, some changes. Um, it split NSF into two, NSF contributions into two, what they call tier one, which is the basic, and then tier two, which is a higher amount, which was going up to 6% of, um, of salary. Mm. Uh, but what that law said is if you have a, a scheme approved by RBA, then you're exempted from the tier two. Mm -hmm. Exactly what John is saying. You know, if you already have this right. other good scheme, then you don't need to contribute to tier two. Mm -hmm. You just do the tier one, which is a low amount. You know, is what we are currently contributing is a very low figure. Mm -hmm. um, so that at least you have the basic here and then you have this income replacement from, from your other scheme. Now, unfortunately, that law, um, there's some people went to the courts and that law has never <laughs> kicked off since 2013. <laughs> As we speak today, we are not, that law has not uh, been implemented. Uh, but I understand that um, there are a lot of high-level discussions with the unions mm -hmm. and others to try and unlock that so that we can move in that direction. Um, but even for the tier one, it's important that that tier one is you know properly invested, yes. that it is, you get it in time and so on. And that's why I was saying earlier that um, you know over the years we have been able to really improve on NSSF in terms of investment, administration, mm. and so on, so that those challenges of the past are, are, are no longer there. We are seeing very many questions coming in on uh, the issues of you know, pensions and managing your pensions and contributions and getting your money out. So Nzomo Motuko, the CEO of the Retirement Benefits Authority, is here with us, and he is graciously accepted to be with us for another couple of minutes into the 9 o'clock so that we can answer the, some of these questions. So you wanted to ask him something, City, before we went in. Yes, this issue of pensions and the contributions that go into pensions, why is it not compulsory? Very good question. Uh, why shouldn't everybody be um, yes. in a scheme? I would, uh, I would say it should be compulsory uh, because at the end of the day, everybody needs to save for, for retirement and it's a good thing. Um, in some countries, they have, they have done it. I think the challenge perhaps in Kenya is that... Um, you know, one, uh, because of this huge informal sector, even if you make it compulsory, it's very hard uh, to, 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 to enforce. Mm. You know, you can say it, but uh, it becomes very difficult to enforce because people are not, their records are not anywhere, and it's hard, uh, it, it's hard to get it. Um, I think number two, um, we kind of had this, um, you know, heritage having come from the British system, and we kind of inherited... Um, the British system, which was a voluntary trust-based system. So we inherited that, and that's what we have been having. But if you look at the UK, you know, recently they came up with a compulsory uh, scheme. Mm -hmm. They call it uh, NEST, and everybody has to has to join. Mm. So I think from the policy perspective, it's something that uh, we, we, we are supporting. Uh, the government is working on um, what they're calling the National Retirement Benefits Policy, mm -hmm. uh, which they want to take to cabinet soon. And we would want perhaps that policy to have some of those proposals in terms of compulsion for, for pension saving. Okay. okay. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. Questions, Ndu? Yeah, sure. Okay, so one is, what is the least amount that can actually um, um, contribute on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis? Will RBA take whatever I have? Um, it differs from scheme to scheme. Every mm. scheme has its rules. Mm. Uh, so there's no set in the law. Uh, we have one scheme, for example, which is called the uh, BAO Pension Plan, which really targets the um, uh, informal sector, the Jokali workers. It's actually sponsored by the Jokali Federation. And the BAO is meaning 20 bob. So oh, they're it's saying BAO of 20 I was thinking contribute 20 for, shillings. Contribute <laughs> <laughs> 20 shillings a day. That's mm. what they are telling their members. Right. Try to send at least 20 
shillings a day, which will be around 600 uh, per month. Mm. So okay. it just varies from scheme to scheme. Okay. Mm. So uh, another question then that came out is that where does this money go? Are you building and growing this money? And then how does it translate for me in the future? Absolutely. Uh, the money is invested uh, in accordance with guidelines that we issue. So they invest in different things. You know, I mentioned real estate earlier. They mm. invest in the capital markets. Mm. They invest in government securities, which is very popular with a lot of schemes. Mm. Uh, they have a little bit even offshore. Uh, they invest in a, a diversified portfolio because the law requires you to diversify so that you don't put all your eggs in, in, one, basket. in one basket. Mm. Um, and then uh, the interest that is earned is credited to the members. Okay. So every year, you get, in fact, every quarter, you get some credit going into into your account in the pension scheme. Mm -hmm. So l last year, which was a very difficult year because of COVID, um, the average return for an industry was around 7.5%, which is at least above inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so at least they got real, um, real returns. If you look at the previous year, it was 17%. Um, so, you know, if you get this money com coming into your scheme and you are saving for, uh, let's say 20 years or 30 years, when you retire, most of the money, maybe even 70% of the money you get, really? will not be what you put in. No. It will be that income because it's compounded. Remember, the 17% from 2019 has now earned another 7% in 2020. Maybe 2021, it will earn another 15%. So it's not what you're putting in. It's actually the investment income, which will be the major uh, source of your money when you retire. Okay. And compound is compound interest is very powerful. It is. You know, because interest earns interest. Mercy, Mercy is asking that is it too early for her to start this for her teenage children? Can she do this on their behalf? I have two teenage boys and if I start this for them, it's likely to be something that they would continue in the future. Is this something that can be considered for me? Add me to that question. <laughs> you, mm. Eric. Well, I don't have two teenage boys, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. You should start. I uh, really urge you to start now uh, because when you start at when they are very young, the amount that you'll be contributing per month is very little mm. because you know that they are going to save for let's say 30 years or 40 years before they, re they retire mm. um, so you don't have to save much you just save a little every every month and over 40 years with that power of compounding you know it will be a huge a huge amount but how will this uh, be but if you start at my under age, your name or under the under child's the name child, the child's this name child is a below 18 um, you, you you what 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 I would advise you to do is maybe um, start within your own um, your own scheme your own scheme or okay. your own account then when they reach uh, 18 because you can transfer you transfer into the child's uh, account but yes you're right you can't have it in your name before um, 18 just like bank accounts and so on but you can start doing it you would know that I'm putting aside you know this 1000 for each of my children mm. uh, into this scheme and when they reach 18 I'm going to open for them accounts in the IPP and I'm going to transfer this money mm. uh, to them mm. in terms of advice on what to do there may be somebody who would be like a fish out of water and they say okay maybe i have some extra money every month which probably shouldn't be looked at like that extra and so i throw it there it should be a priority so they say i don't know where to start i don't know what would be best for me which scheme should i enter into knowing that i could retire soon and i have children behind me uh, in terms of advice is it readily available are there people who can go to you know, fund managers things like this who or what direction could you point them in um, of course, for us, all the 36 uh, that uh, we register, we, uh, they're all our babies. Mm. So <laughs> we never say this one is better than the other. Uh -huh. um, uh, so you can join any. But of course, different schemes target different groups. You know, there are those which are targeting higher end mm. individuals. So they may have high minimum. So you may not be able to join. Somebody may not be able to join that one. Mm. Or it may be the right one for them. Uh, there are those which are targeting the informal sector. There are those which are targeting uh, professionals and so on. Um, so the best starting point is our website uh, because, like I said, it uh, has the list and it has links. So you can go and check each of them and see which one, um, which one suits you. Uh, but you can also visit us in our in our office. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, a customer desk uh, where you can come and you know they can just give you some general advice uh, mm -hmm. without pointing you in a particular scheme. But they can give you general advice about the things to look for uh, mm -hmm. in the scheme. Julius is asking. So uh, they've been a member uh, of a scheme that was set up by the employer and then they leave employment are they able to draw out all the money and take it to an IPP of their choice and he already has an answer he says no because you only could withdraw their personal contribution the employer's contribution was locked to that scheme so how do they get to benefit from the 
the other contribution that they've left to the employer scheme? Uh, Judith, there are two things. Um, when you leave an employer, you can access a certain amount. Uh, that's the 50% she's talking about. You mm -hmm. can access 50% of employer contribution and 100%. By access, I mean take it out in cash, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, which is also risky because mm -hmm. you, know, you have been saving it. for retirement. You can take <laughs> the money out and you end up squandering it, and then you don't have anything in retirement, yeah. or you only have the 50% of employer in retirement. Um, that is one, and we always encourage people to avoid that. You know, if you're moving from one job, if you're working uh, for, for Standard and you go to work in Nation, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't take your money out of Standard. Uh, you know, you should uh, either leave it there or transfer it to Nation or transfer it to an IPP. Okay. So the second thing is that you can transfer all of it, even the 50% she's talking about, mm. to a new scheme, including okay. an IPP. Okay. Uh, but even when you transfer it, you still will not be able to access it until retirement. So th that 50%, of employers is locked until retirement. So you can transfer, but you will still not access it until uh, retirement. Okay. But it is still yours, and you can put it to the place that you're happy with. Okay. So if you have left in bad blood, <laughs> and you don't want them to keep your money, <laughs> you feel free. Transfer it somewhere else. Transfer it to one of the 36 IPPs. It will yeah. still continue to grow there. Yes. Zoma, what's to guarantee that folks' money is safe? What's to guarantee that, you know, you start re you start saving for retirement at 40, 30, 35? What's to guarantee that in 30 years, I'll get this money that I've been putting in every month? Your guarantee is the legal framework mm. because we have a very robust um, uh, legal framework mm. uh, to protect this, uh, this money. So, you know, um, of course, money which is invested, there are good years and there are bad years. Sure. So, like I said, last year was a bad year. We got seven percent, you know. But the previous year was um, seventeen percent. So yes, uh, you know, in terms of the return, mm. uh, there's um, there's always f uh, fluctuations. Um, s but because of this framework that we have put, where you have de forced you to diversify, because the schemes must diversify. This framework where you're using professionals, because they must use fund managers. This framework where you're using custodians, so that you know if something happens. Uh, to the scheme, the money itself is with a separate person, the custodian. Mm. So you can still get your money out. So because of all these checks and balances, you know, you're pretty sure that uh, the money is safe. But if you're very risk averse, uh, we also have a product within uh, the industry which is called the guaranteed funds. Uh, guaranteed funds guarantee you that no matter what happens, um, and they're normally done by insurance companies, uh, they will pay you a certain amount. So let's say 5%. Mm -hmm. So they'll say no matter what happens in the market, even if the actual investment loses money, mm -hmm. as an insurance company, we are going to put in our own money to make sure that you get at least 5%. Mm -hmm. So for those really risk-averse individuals, this is a guaranteed fund product which they can use um, to ensure at, at least they get a certain amount. Okay. Mm -hmm. We thank you very much for joining us today, uh, Nzomo. Give a final message as you like your parting shot, right? To everybody who's listening, who's followed this conversation this morning. What is it that you think they need to know about RB and about pension schemes? Yes, my parting shot really is to urge uh, particularly the youth, particularly um, those in uh, the, what we call gig economy and the informal sector and so on. You know, uh, don't be left out of this opportunity to save for, for your retirement. Uh, you know, your former sector colleagues probably they just joined that job they didn't even do anything their employer had already set up a scheme they had no choice and now they are saving but they are going to benefit uh, from it uh, when uh, when they retire uh, but if you don't have that advantage of having an employer who has done this for you um, then you really need to take it upon yourself um, uh, to, 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 to see how you can save for retirement mm -hmm. so the government has given tax incentives so that people can save for retirement they have set up a regulatory body to make sure your money is safe um, so Let's not lose the opportunity. Let's say for retirement. Um, I w retirement is, is a fluid term. You know, we are not saying that um, when you reach a certain age, you must stop working or <laughs> you, you have to go home. No. <laughs> uh, but, you know, at some point, uh, you would want to have this income which is coming uh, f to, to safeguard you in, in, in those older age. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people say that um, I'll work for, for long. But eventually, at some point, uh, you will stop working, and this income will come in. Um, it will come in very handy. So let's take advantage of what is there, and start saving as as early as possible. Thank you very much. Zomo Mutuko is the CEO of the Retirement Benefits Authority. He's been with us since eight o'clock, telling us about what the RBA has been doing and the registered schemes and how the benefits of basically looking at your own retirement and starting to plan early into what towards that. Zomo, welcome back soon. 
right? So we can have this conversation and more, more and more people will be asking now specific questions about their schemes or what they'd like to do to, to join this. Asante Sano for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. And we know you're a listener of this show. So, so. Oh, yes, I am. Yeah, you're the one who calls and you call yourself. Okay, no. <laughs> 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 Have a good one. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life.